Um, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. Um, and then we're going to read from 2 Peter, chapter 1. So if you want to find 2 Peter and stick your finger in there, and then uh, we're going to read Matthew first. Beginning with the first verse, chapter 17, Matthew's Gospel, beginning with the first verse. Listen now for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and he touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And then if you would flip over to 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard the voice that came from heaven when we were there with him on the sacred mountain. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to um, meditate upon your word, to listen to stories that are somewhat familiar, uh, to celebrate who you are and whose we are. God, speak to our hearts today. We long to see you. We long to hear you, living God. Thank you. Bless your holy name. Amen. After six days. Six days after what? Don't you love it when they um, start the scripture? The next day. Well, the next day after what? Do you know what that causes you to need to do in your Bibles? Go research. Go back and see what happened just before that. So if you look back, right before that, um, there have been a couple things that have happened. Jesus has done some amazing miracles. And then, um, and then uh, Jesus calls the disciples together. And he says, uh, you've been listening You've been listening and talking among yourselves. Um, who do people, who are people saying that I am? Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. It says this in chapter 16. Um, but then Jesus looks to the disciples and says, all right, what about you? What do you say? I mean, 
there are people in the crowd that have been following at a distance. Maybe some are coming and going. Maybe some seeing and hearing Jesus for the very first time. But Jesus has been traveling for a while with the disciples. At this point in their journey, they are on the way to Jerusalem. They're in the area called Caesarea Philippi. They are on the way to Jerusalem. And um, that means that the crucifixion is not too far off in the distance. And so they've been traveling with Jesus a couple of years at least now. And they've been watching things. They've been seeing miracles. Um, certainly every day with Jesus they've gotten more affirmation that following him was the right thing to do. How about you? Do you get that affirmation every single day? That you know that following Jesus was definitely the right thing to do. Do you do that? Yeah, following Jesus is definitely the right thing to do. So disciples, certainly day after day, hearing and seeing, being a part of what Jesus was doing, certainly every single day they had the opportunity to reaffirm, yep, following Jesus was the right thing. But now Jesus is saying, you've heard what the crowd say, who is this man? Who is this? What is he doing? Uh, others in the crowd who are persecuting him and saying, what does he think he's doing? But they know because they've seen and they've heard and they've given testimony to what Jesus has done, to what Jesus has said, to the power of God that certainly is in Jesus Christ. And they have become convicted that there is something very special about this one. So Jesus says, who do you, who do you say that I am? It was Peter, my favorite disciple, who spoke up. He, he often speaks up when the rest of them are kind of kicking their toe in the dirt going, uh... What's the right answer? Because I don't want to speak out and get it wrong. You ever feel that way? How many, how many of you were hand raisers in the classroom in school? None of you? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. Do you have, Teresa, in your classroom, do you have certain kids that just really get it and they know every answer and they're hand raisers? Do you have some other kids that you know get it, but they're not sure? They're too shy. They're not confident in themselves yet. So I, I was always a little bit scared. And so even if I knew the answer, I was kind of scared to speak out. Most of the disciples are kind of like that too. So we're in good company, right? Um, not having confidence and kind of kicking our toe in the sand and looking around going, if I make eye contact, he's going to call on me. So I'm not going to look at him. <laughs> and it's Peter who doesn't mind speaking up whether he gets it right or wrong. There's Peter. There's one little boy in our Cub Scout troop, little redhead boy whose name I can't come up with right now, but he is the most curious kid. Do you know who I'm talking about, Colton? Uh, he, he is the most curious kid, and he is constantly raising his hand saying, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Obviously, he's been taught that interrupting is rude, and so he's been taught that you say excuse me and you raise your hand, but you don't wait. He, he doesn't ever wait for another. Excuse me, excuse me. I have a question. Sometimes it's relevant, sometimes it's not. I think Peter was a little bit like that. He didn't mind speaking out, and it was Peter who spoke out and said, Jesus, you are the Right. And you can almost imagine, as Peter says it, he's coming to really grasp it for himself. Because up until this point, Jesus hasn't said, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one. He's given them the opportunity to say, who do you say? And it's Peter who says, you, you're the one, you are the Messiah. So it's six days after that. Oh, and it's, and it's right after that, though. Right after that, that Jesus starts talking about death. Peter didn't like that so much. And he kind of remember the, the story where he, you can imagine him pulling Jesus aside and going, Jesus, now, now that we know you're the Messiah, you're the one, people are not going to want to hear about this death and stuff. <laughs> and Jesus says to Peter, what do you, what do you think he says? Get behind me, Satan. So Peter went right around from getting it right to getting it totally wrong. Get behind me, Satan. You're thinking of the things of man. I'm thinking of the things of God. So this is the conversation that they've been having on the way to Jerusalem. And it's six days later when Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him up the mountain. Why did they go up that mountain? They didn't know. They went because Peter, James, and John went because Jesus said, come with me. And why did Jesus take Peter, James, and John with him? Because 
they're going to need to have some witnesses to that powerful exchange. And man, talk about a power meeting. Jesus, the son of the living God, Moses, the giver of law, Elijah, one of the greatest prophets who spoke forth the truth of God and of Jesus Christ long before Jesus the Messiah appeared on the scene. What a power meeting, those three up on the mountain. Imagine being able to witness that. Maybe you'd be uh, a bowl of jelly. <laughs> the disciples kind of were. The scripture says that when that happened, they fell. They fell down before Jesus. When they saw, actually before they fell down, they saw Jesus. He was glowing. His head, his face, his clothing <coughs> were all glowing white. When you picture what Jesus looks like, what do you picture? Have you, have you ever seen the picture of Jesus laughing? I love that picture. Google Jesus laughing sometimes and look at that wonderful <clears throat> portrait of Jesus with his head thrown back. Or do you picture Jesus with the crown of thorns on his head? Do you picture Jesus still hanging on the cross? Laura Chalfant told a story this week, uh, a really powerful story in Bible study. She says she was five or six years old, six or seven years old, when she really came to know Jesus, when she really had that heartwarming, I know that I know Jesus. And it was um, at a season when they were talking about um, what they did to Jesus, when they drove the nails in, um, in his hands and his feet, and when they stabbed him in his side, when they crucified him. And her, she, she grew up Catholic, and, and her grandmother, who raised her, had all these crucifixes throughout her house. And some of them were family heirlooms. Laura said, I went around and I pulled all the nails out of all the crucifixes. Um, and she got into a lot of trouble for that, you can imagine. <laughs> but for her, that was a way of saying, there's enough of this. There's, there's enough of this Jesus suffering for me. There's enough of this. What a powerful, powerful testimony for a little girl. What, a, what an amazing understanding of who Christ was for her to want to get him down off of that cross. A recognition that he was suffering. And, and maybe her way of knowing as a young child that her sin had something to do with his suffering. Your sin and my sin have something to do with his <clears throat> suffering. So when Jesus is meeting with Moses and Elijah, on the mountain. What a powerful, powerful time. And it's when God spoke. Now remember these words that God spoke? I just said them with the children. Um, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When else have we heard that? Those words from God at Jesus' baptism. We heard those. But guess who wasn't there at that time? Peter wasn't there. James, John, they weren't there. And so they haven't heard God speak, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's when they fall down. That's when the anxiety comes. Do you ever feel anxious about faithfulness and about getting it right and about um, having to keep it together and do everything you're supposed to do? There was this man um, pushing his two-year-old son through a store and um, the little two-year-old was just fussy, and the dad was going, it's okay, Billy, be patient, don't worry, it, it, you can handle this, Billy. And this woman observed this, and she went up to the man, and she said, I just have to say, I'm so blessed by how you are reassuring your little boy. Um, hey, Billy, he's so cute. And she said, and the man says, um, that's not Billy, this is my son Patrick, my name's Billy. <laughs> It's Jesus. When the disciples look up again, Moses and Elijah are gone. It's Jesus who says, be patient. It's okay. And he says several things to them that I think are notable for us from the mountain of transfiguration. First thing he says to them is get up. Get up. Get up and look around. Everything's okay now. Get up. Don't be afraid, Jesus says to them. Get up. Don't be afraid. It's a call to action. It's a call to look at how the ordinary 
where the extraordinary was has become ordinary again, and somehow we have to be the ones to bridge the ordinary and the extraordinary because we've witnessed it. So we have to first get up and not let the fear overwhelm us. It's okay, Billy. Everything's going to be okay. Get up. The next thing Jesus says is, come down. Once they've gotten past the fear and they've gotten up, Jesus says, come down. Peter, you see Peter run up. Did you see him run up? Did you see it in your mind? I see him running up with Jesus. He's got a roll of blueprints under his, under his arm. And he runs up to Jesus and rolls out the blueprints and says, I can build this. And we can stay right here with Moses and Elijah. Oh my gracious, what a great time we will have on this mountaintop. we got to stay up here. And Jesus just, Jesus doesn't even acknowledge Peter this time. Same Peter who said, you're the Messiah. Same Peter who had to be told, get behind me, Satan. Same Peter who is always the one outspoken. Jesus just kind of rolls his eyes at him. And he says, get up and come down. We have to come down. Do you know what Jesus and the disciples do right after they come down from that mountain? They heal someone. There's a child who needs to be healed. Jesus has got more work to do. And so he says to the disciples, come down. Get up and come down. And then Jesus says to the disciples, shh, keep this quiet. Keep this quiet until after the Savior has been resurrected. Keep this quiet. Shh. Do you ever wonder why Jesus says keep this quiet? I think it has something to do with the nature of the mystery. What's a mystery? How are, how are you at solving mysteries? If you're pretty good at solving mysteries, then it wasn't much of a mystery anyway. Because mysteries are things that we can't wrap our brain around. Mystery, the word um, comes from a Greek word that says to close the mouth or lips. I didn't know that, did you? Mystery, to close the mouth or the lips, not to talk about it, to have a period of retrospection. The psalmist would say, be still and know that I am God. There's sometimes that we just can't explain what God has done and is doing in our lives. Can you explain <clears throat> why this week? You feel better why this week you're on crutches and not in a wheelchair? Can you explain it? Yeah. Yeah, but do you understand it? Yeah. <laughs> do you understand when you come to communion why the bread becomes the power of God? That we are nourished by that little piece of bread and that little bit of juice? And that the power of God comes in that to nourish our souls? Can you explain that holy mystery? No. There are certain things that we have to take by faith and we have to contemplate and just soak in them for a while. So Jesus says, get up, come down the mountain, and shh, don't talk about it yet. And then he says, but later, talk about it. And Peter sure did, because in the scripture that we read from 1 Peter, Peter said, you know what, um, 2 Peter, sorry, uh, uh, we didn't follow any stories that were handed down to us through, or, uh, through oral tradition. That's not how we got this understanding of who Jesus was. We were there on this mountaintop. Good thing it wasn't just Peter, because we would have believed it. Right? Peter, James, and John, three witnesses of God's mighty presence, of God saying, this is my son. Listen to him. If there was ever any doubt before, after the resurrection, there was no doubt anymore. And now they could say, you know, looking back, there's a few things that I saw along the way that I knew that I knew that I knew something was powerful and something was different about Jesus. Now that's God revealing the holy where there was mystery. So where are you in your life today in seeing Christ transfigured? When, when Christ was transfigured, um, the word transfigured comes from the word metamorphosis, which sometimes means a change or a transformation. And that definition can be a little misleading when we think about Jesus being transfigured because the transfiguration of Jesus, his face and his clothing being changed is not a change to something 
about Jesus, but it's an uncovering of who Jesus was and who Jesus is. Today, I pray that you will let the power of Jesus Christ work in your life. And that you will not fall like a crumble, but you will get up. And that you will acknowledge the power and that you will go down from the mountaintop because God has work for you to do in this world. And that sometimes you'll need to be quiet and just be in God's presence, but other times you need to tell it all because of the experience you've had in Christ Jesus. Unless you're living it, unless you're walking it, you're not going to be able to tell it. Unless you're putting yourself in places where you can experience the mighty, mighty power of God, you're not going to have the opportunity to share real live witness testimonies. I want you to have real life testimonies. I remember when I was um, college age or, or even younger, um, I remember when I was in middle school, we had um, a choir, a youth choir came to our church and the kids gave these testimonies. And I mean, one kid had been involved with drugs, and he had had such a hard time. Now, back in the 70s, people didn't talk about that quite as openly as we do nowadays. But he was offering testimony of how God saved him from that, and how God helped him get clean, and, and how God found him and offered himself to this kid through Jesus Christ. And he had an awesome testimony. And I thought, man, I wish I had a testimony. Well, you know what? Somebody helped me figure out later that my testimony was God kept me. Over and over when I could have gotten in trouble, God kept me. Over and over when I very easily was led down the wrong path, God corrected me and God kept me. Over and over in my life when I needed a word of wisdom, God would send a person to me and help guide me, help me to discern God kept me. What's your testimony today of what God is doing? You got something to talk about. I know you do. Put yourself in a place where you can see God's power at work. Be quiet about it. And ask God to be in the midst of it. Then tell about it. Tell where Jesus has touched your life. Let us pray. Oh, holy are you, most high God. We're so thankful for you and all that you've done for us and all that you are doing for us. Blessed Lord Jesus Christ, reveal yourself to us. Oh, how we long to see you in your power, in your glory. Teach us, God, then, having seen you, to get up and to go down out of the fear and into the calling, how to keep quiet and to soak in what you've done and then how to tell about it through the testimonies, the opportunities that you give us, not just to speak it, but to live your power. Help us to know you. Help us to serve.